Hi, I'm Jim Boyd. I'm the Technology Director here at IRE. And today, uh, I'm going to talk about space. And it turns out, uh, space is really, really big. I mean, it's hard to even understand how big it is. Usually the numbers that are thrown out, uh, millions and billions of miles, uh, light years, they're difficult to comprehend. You know, I, I think of this like the national deficit uh, without any sort of context. Trillions of dollars doesn't mean anything in my everyday life. So it's hard for me to even really understand what these numbers mean. So I thought if I could have a better understanding of this, I think the best place to start would be having some sort of map, something to give me some scale of how big the universe really is. And I probably can't understand all of it, so why don't I start with uh, our solar system, right? I mean, that's actually a place that we can go. Uh, it's within humanity's grasp. So often when you see maps of the solar system, you find something like this. And this is fine for helping you understand where the planets are in relation to each other and from the sun. But they don't really give any sense of scale about how big these planets are in relation to each other. So this is actual imagery to scale of our planets in the solar system. And that's us way over there, uh, the small blue dot, uh, the third blue dot from the right. Uh, Mars is just a little bit to the left of Earth, so it's quite a bit smaller. As you can see, we're, we're pretty darn tiny compared to the gas giants uh, in the outer solar system. Now this tells us about scale, uh, comparing the planets, but it doesn't really tell us anything about distances. And it turns out those are, are pretty hard to understand. So I went out looking for a map, a scale map of the solar system. And the problem is that these don't exist, and there's a, there's a pretty good reason. If you take a pencil and you make a dot on a piece of paper, and that dot represents Earth, you can't fit the map of the solar system in this room. In fact, you can't even fit it in this building, right? So it's, it's pretty big. So I thought the best way to explain the distances in space would be with some props. So I need a volunteer from the audience. Anyone? Anyone? OK, Sasha, come on up. OK, so we have So this is going to be the Earth today. And this is going to be maybe the moon. Okay. So you take the moon. I'm going to stand over here on my dot. This is going to be the Earth, and I want you to come over here, on this side of me over here, and just put the moon where you think the moon orbits, the distance from the Earth. So how far do you think it orbits? Ah, you are very close. Look on the floor. There's a green dot somewhere. Hey, look at that. Look at it. See? <laughs> so that's a long ways, right? It's, it's a lot farther than it seems. Like when you look up in the sky, you see the moon, and it just seems like it's right there. And this kind of puts in context to me how alone uh, those astronauts who uh, flew on the Apollo missions to go the farthest humanity has ever gone uh, went this far. So the Earth is about 24,000 miles in circumference. Uh, the moon is about 240,000 miles away. Right? Okay, so go ahead and set that on your dot. You can go ahead and sit down, Sasha. Let's give Sasha a round of applause. <laughs> Okay, so another place we often talk about uh, when we think about colonizing the solar system, uh, probably our most likely second home is Mars. As you can see, Mars is quite a bit smaller than we are here on the Earth. Uh, and I wanted to use some scale models like this to represent uh, the distance from Earth to Mars. Uh, but it turns out that's pretty hard. So I need another volunteer from the audience. Anyone? Hey, come on. Okay. So, we have the Earth. Can everybody see that little, that little dot there? That's, that's the Earth. And I'm going to take the Earth, and you are going to take Mars. There you go. Okay, so I will stand here, and you go ahead and stand where you think Mars is in relation to Earth. Okay, got to keep going. Got to keep going. A little further. Okay, I'll give you a hint, it's not on the stage. <laughs> yeah, that's a, good, that's a good way to go. Okay, keep going. Got to keep going. Okay. 
Yep, see you later. <laughs> okay, all the way back in that far corner, put it way up in the corner so we can all still see it. Okay, now if I put the earth uh, way over here, it turns out that we are still about 10 feet short of how far away earth is from Mars. That's an awful long ways. That's uh, 34 million miles at the closest distance. Now keep in mind, the earth and the sun, or excuse me, the earth and Mars go around the sun. I right, thank you, you can just go ahead and turn that off and keep it. Uh, earth and the sun, earth and Mars go around the sun. And sometimes they're close and sometimes they're far apart. So even at the closest distance, uh, that's the distances and the scales we're talking about, right? So, as you can see, space is really, really, really big. And if you want to get anywhere in space, you probably have to move really, really, really fast. But how fast do you have to move? So an average bullet travels about 1,700 miles per hour. And this is the International Space Station. Uh, this travels at 17,200 miles an hour. That's, that's pretty fast as it goes around uh, the Earth orbit. And fun fact, uh, how far do you think it orbits away from the Earth, if this is the Earth? Turns out it's uh, about a millimeter from here. That, that's how close it is when it's, when it's orbiting. And if we want to go to Mars in any reasonable amount of time, uh, let's say six to nine months, uh, we probably have to be leaving Earth orbit at about 36,000 miles per hour. So that's about 21 times the speed of an average bullet. And so, uh, as Newton's law, uh, or Newton's second law teaches us, uh, you, if something's moving really, really fast, uh, it can have quite a huge impact. So that speed really does matter, right? So it's a good thing that space is really empty and there's not a whole lot in it when we're hurtling at these crazy high speeds out to Mars, right? Or is it empty? Because after all, I mean, we've been launching rockets and we've been launching spacecraft into space for almost 60 years now. And it turns out uh, there's an awful lot of junk out here. So this is a representation of all of the, uh, the larger objects we have around the planet. There's about 17, or excuse me, uh, 170 million objects orbiting the Earth. Uh, the, of that, 22,000 of them are larger than a softball, and 500,000 of them are larger than a marble. And so that's a lot of stuff out there. And uh, it's not stopping anytime soon that we're going to be putting more things in space. Uh, SpaceX just got uh, approval to launch 4,000 new satellites around the globe for their initiative for a global internet service. Uh, and it sounds like about 12,000 new satellites will be launched before 2020, right? So, okay, so what we're looking at here is this is a, a hole from something about the size of a grain of sand that hit one of our orbiting satellites. And it doesn't really take much of a mass of an object when things are moving that fast. Uh, NASA spends a ton of money trying to track all of these objects, but they can only track things down a little bit smaller than the size of a baseball. And so uh, the, even the space shuttle uh, would routinely get cracks in its windshield. Uh, several of them were attributed to hitting flecks of paint. So don't get me wrong, uh, I am a huge advocate of space exploration. I think uh, often it brings out the best in us. Uh, we invent new materials and new technologies. Uh, and it helps us understand who we are and where our place is in space. But this problem of cleaning up after ourselves is not going to go away even when we start living on other worlds, right? We're always going to be uh, faced with what do we do with our products after they stop working, right? We design lots of products, we have uh, different new technologies all the time, but eventually everything becomes obsolete or it breaks, and then what? So product end of life is defined as the point in a product's life when the vendor is no longer responsible for the functioning of that product, right? So we have a small graph here, it's kind of hard to see, uh, but way out over on the other end we have the end of life, uh, here we have customers can buy the product here during that, like, let's say, a three-year period. Let's say this is an iPhone or a Samsung phone. Uh, but then it's expected to work for a little while after that. But after that, it's not the company's problem, right? So we all have 
some bad examples that we know of, of times when products were created or used that where there wasn't a good plan for after end of life of this product. Uh, plastic bottles in the ocean, uh, climate change. But I wanted to talk about some good examples. We have Samsung and Apple. Uh, both of these companies have spent a lot of time and energy developing really good recycling programs uh, so that when their devices become obsolete, you can send them back to them and they'll, they'll recycle these products, reuse the materials. Apple goes as far as trying to source materials that are most easily recyclable, uh, namely aluminum and glass. So how do we fix this problem of all of the junk around the planet, all this space junk? Uh, well, one thing maybe that could be done, there's, there's been many ideas proposed, is to uh, program these satellites to push themselves into a burn-up orbit around the planet before they go obsolete, before they lose contact with them. Because most of those parts floating around uh, in space are defunct old satellites that have fallen apart. Another thought is to uh, possibly impose some sort of tax on launching satellites. And maybe that money goes towards the costly cleanup of uh, that space debris, right? So as engineers of the future, I think it's always important to keep in mind the product end of life. Somebody somewhere has to dispose of your product. And what can you do to make that process a good one? Make that process, uh, that transition, a good transition, right? This problem of cleaning up after ourselves is never going to go away, even when we start moving into the great expanse of space. Thank you.